Greetings everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here as we look at a small sneak peek of Master Gus's Hall Presidency. The inauguration of President Hall. The crowd and all their hundreds of thousands look like a fever dream. Labor stalwarts from the UAW have the uneasy grins of those caught up in events beyond belief. Elders whose parents stare down militiamen at Lawrence, who were lifted up onto the shoulders of others who see Debs speak at Canton who spent their lives writing and agitating in pursuit of a future they desperately hoped could someday ma be made real, are watching with glistening eyes. Long-haired students and proudly Afroed activists who got their start fighting against the South Africa draft are gathered in circles, taking turns denouncing America and grudgingly congratulating the president-elect. Most of them thought they would do anything but loathe the American electoral system. Most of them still do, but at the moment, that matters a little bit less. A number of senators and congresspeople have boycotted the inauguration, but the crowd of notables behind President Hall's podium is still large. The Chief Justice administers the oath without enthusiasm, and the crowd roars, My fellow American citizens of the world, comrades. The crowd roars harder, almost drowning out the new president through stump speeches, ballot boxes, door-to-door -door campaigning, and all the electoral institutions written down by wig-clad slavers. Revolution, however tenuous, has come to America today. The world shakes once more. So we don't only get the last bastion of liberty, national spirit, but we get uh, we place and we also replace a hope, a ray of hope, with the American malaise. Ah, uh, cool. We can br bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old. For the union makes us strong. Hmm. Okay, so my apologies about that. If you wonder why the audio stopped, why I stopped speaking, it was just because I wanted to see it here if there's a little event here. So, awesome. Let's do the Hall of Presidency. Nobody thought it could happen here, but today no one can deny that it has. The U.S., the Imperial Corps, the world bastion of capitalist industry, the oldest, most stable bourgeois democracy in the world has elected a communist president. Few could have predicted this moment, but there were signs there. Gustus Hall's meteoric ascent to the White House has taken place in a perfect storm created by the disastrous and previous administrations and the increasingly explosive breakdown of American society. The South African and Indonesian wars, the civil rights movement, the wanton attacks on unions, growing distrust in the federal government, and an explosion of radicalism amongst American youth have combined to make the communist wing of the N NPP the final option for many Americans. Now H Hall must pick up the pieces left by previous administrations and set about what he was going to what he was elected to do. Plant in the infertile soil of capitalist America the seeds of a new socialist society. And to get Gus Hall, I went from Nixon, of course. Oh, look at this. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Went from Nixon to RFK. I went crazy as RFK and got assassinated. Went to Strom Thurn Thurman. And then I believe that led to Tricky Dick. Not Tricky Dick. No. From Strom, Strom Thurman to Barry Goldwater. Now to Gus Hall. Very cool. He's a member of the Communist Party of the USA, or C. Pusa. Awesome. And also, with Barry Goldwater, we're, we've done extremely well with our GDP. Look at that. Over a trillion dollars. No debt. Annual deficit's minus 120. Growth is five times our debt interest. Love it. Regardless, let's make America socialist. Memories, memories of Lincoln. There seems to be only a few great revolutions in American history. Points in which, even through the constant resistance of the upper class, the founding ideals of this nation shone through. The meek have just for a moment inherited the nation. Of course, these were temporary ordeals. As soon as the working class grabbed a handful of liberty, it was torn away from them. As soon as slaves revolted against their masters, it was brutally subdued. There remains one exception to the tragic cycle. Greater than any fleeting previous revolution was the rise of the magnificent President Abraham Lincoln. He, the great emancipator of American history, walked hand in hand with Marx in the battle for freedom. His hallowed actions remain indif indefatigable through racist, the racist and landowners tirelessly attempt to tear them down. For the first time in history, rights were lastingly given to the downtrodden. Lincoln made manifest to the nation the ability of the working people to smash the capitalist class just as he vanquished the slavers of the South. Now, a hundred years later, after Lincoln's crusade against injustice, we have finally embarked on a new revolution, one equal in magnitude. This time, all men, black or white, will be finally be free of that terrible curse, slavery of wages. Capitalists, tremble in your boots, weep for your property, read your feeble defense, for the proletariat of America has woken. Looks better in other states. He captured Harper's Ferry with his 19 men so true. He framed old Virginia till she trembled through and through. They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitor a crew, but his soul goes marching on. Oh boy. And then, ooh, I don't, I don't even worry about that. Crush the fifth column, though. The capitalists of America tremble in their gilded palaces, dis 
despairing, despairing for the ill-gotten wealth and the rotten empire. They know that we are their mortal class enemies and that we get away, how we'll burn their putrid systems to the ground. No doubt they plot ceaselessly for a way to sink their poisoned fangs into the president and restore a faithful lackey monopoly capital to the White House. To assist in this task, they will recruit their most loyal servants, the jackbooted thugs of the CIA and FBI. While the federal agencies claim loyalty to the Constitution and the President, we know where their true allegiance lies. Hoover's dogs exist exclusively to harass, persecute, and kill unionists and activists. The CIA exists to do exactly the same thing, but in the jungles of Central America, Indonesia, and South Africa, and not the streets of Chicago and Memphis. These blood-drenched killers constitute a reactionary fifth column within the American federal government, poised to turn on us at a moment's notice. A house divided against itself cannot stand. The fifth columnist must be excised from the new American state, not only as justice for the countless beaten, jailed, and dead at their hands, but to ensure that they cannot undermine the authority and power of the president. We cannot tolerate the existence of a reactionary fifth column. You've got mail. And it behooves me to remind you, sir, that the war has claimed good men from both sides. Honoring the terrorists who had, our, who had set our greatest tragedy in motion besmirches their sacrifice and yada yada yada. President Gus Hall tossed the letter aside. Add one more to the pile built up like cow crap since he signed the, since the, signed the pardon. The upstanding gentleman from Montgomery even had his, his stamped with the traitor's rag, some people's gall. The door swung open right on cue, revealing a sack plump of, with paper and standing on two shaky legs. So the visitor hall said, hey, Tyner, ever read some of this stuff yet? Chief of Staff Jarvis Tyner huffed as he hauled his sack towards the great seal where mail of all sizes gathered into a high, hill waist high. Read one and you read them all, I reckon. Oof, this one, this one ain't, ain't this heavy. Grunting, he dumped his sack on top of the hill. It fell as a body would onto a bale of hay, but with paper instead of a straw flying all over. This is the fifth bag this morning, Sir Tyner sighed out. Don't see it letting any time soon. Just means the heater's not going to get hungry anytime soon, either. While Tyner busied himself with the unsorted mail, Hall inspected the Oval Office's brand new liquor cabinet. He set his eyes on a bottle of hard cider, which he retrieved with a grim. Leave champagne and bourbon for the petty bourgeois. Real men drink themselves silly with 25 proof. Now, come on, kid. I'm in celebrating mood, and the elder ain't drinking it itself. Or the cider isn't drinking itself. Well, maybe the elder's not drinking itself, but the duo offered the night's toast to Mr. John Brown. A stability. The NPP looks a little worse in the South. The far right grows a little bit more popular. Yaki's popularity grows up as well as the Democrats look a little better as well. Cool. Doesn't matter. Just click on buttons. And more buttons. I love buttons. Crush the fifth column after this. We're going to put down Dixie. For the entirety of American history, racism has been deployed as a tool of the ruling classes. First employed to justify the evils of slavery, it began to serve as an ideological poison that induced white workers to act against their own self-interest, dividing the black and white proletariat along, proletariat along, proletariat along racial lines. There's a typo in there. The capitalists have succeeded time and time again in using racism to silence the calls of unity that would threaten their rule. Racism is, in their final analysis, a capitalist hammer against American worker. That is why the cabal of a capitalist lackeys that preceded Hall failed constantly and consistently to advance the cause of civil rights, to allow the racial divide that plagues the nation to heal. The Republicans and Democrats would prefer that white workers continue under the sway of backwards racial chauvinism, and that the black worker be too cowed, downtrodden, and afraid to stand up to his oppressor with the vanguard of the people occupying the White House. Now is the time to strike the final decisive blow against black oppression. Those who claim to be progressive opposed to the cause of segregationists passed the Civil Rights Act. It was a token piece of legislation when given small freedoms to blacks. We will introduce something truly revolutionary to Congress. Finally, the promises made by Lincoln a century ago will be fulfilled. A real Civil Rights Act, one that guarantees no man is unsheltered by justice. Reactionaries clamor for states' rights. They yell from the rooftops, injustice of reach, socialism. We will show them socialism. We will show them what... The long arm of the federal government can truly achieve if the South will not come into the 20th century willingly. We will be more than happy to drag them into it, kicking and screaming. New Civil Rights Act? Hopefully we can pass it. Unearthing the bones. What can you tell me about Hoover and Helms? Ordered President Gus Hall. Secretary of Defense William Martin shuffled in his seat. They're directors of the FBI and CIA, respectively, he intoned in measured halts. In pursuit of national security, the federal government repeatedly allowed their stations wide purview and little oversight. They thus pursued extra legal means to combat America's ideological opponents at home and abroad. Fancy words for something so simple, Mr. Secretary, laughed the President. His mirth fell short of his leer. You could have just told me that the two most powerful men in America could have just said they did whatever, wherever, whenever they wanted. Whites and hoods lynch blacks without a care, fascists march up and down the mall, organizing go missers, or organizers go missing. But end of the day, their puppeteers are still in charge, still richer than God, the President leaned a hair forwards. Ain't I right? 
Marge sank back into his chair, shying away from the glaring lights of sweltering heat, the pressure that overwhelmed. Fixing his tie, he replied, Well, we should acknowledge that no matter how necessary this may be, our national defense against the forces of global fascism will be severely crippled. A crippled limb that we can still heal in our image, Hall slid a dossier folder towards the secretary, taping or tapping its cover thrice, but I understand. Just get to work. I want this done as soon as you can. Nothing else needed saying. The president wished for our biblical deluge to visit the twin agencies. Just a smiting rotten wood into splinters. He likened, never mind the damage dealt onto the bulwarks against Germany and Tokyo. In fact, irreparable damage might even be the Unionists intent. For a brief moment, Hall's headsmen contemplated an American left helpless and blind before the whims of foreign powers. But orders are orders, and so he sharpened his axe. And yet I'm still investing in GDP. Ooh, love it. Also, we are, our stability is not looking very good. We still have Jim Crow, by the way, so... It is what it is. Yeah. Oh, Civil Rights Act. Ooh. Okay, so this is definitely not going to pass. So, I'll try to... Oh, none of the 50 Democrats. Yeah. Well, I'll try to get a way to get this passed. There's no guarantee, though. But we'll see the failure of it. And then we'll come back together once we see and read the uh, failure of the passing. And... Hopefully very soon... Oh, we got about three days, so. Two days left. Yeah, that's not good. With 38 Republicans, we have only two L NPP. So, coping with failure. Proves that American democracy is alive and well, despite certain radicals, ham fisted attempts to hijack it for their own ends. For these odious persons, I will say only this. The American people have spoken, they speak loudly against. Shut it off, Tyner. Mealy mouth dude said enough. What now, sir? Don't look so glum. Half of Congress just out of themselves as filthy hypocrites they are. Should surprise nobody, at least all of us. Make no mistake, this is a terrible setback. Your brothers got their hopes dashed for a second, maybe third time in ten years, but setbacks stop the fight for common dang decency. Not one bet. The men before us face gun barrels and strike breakers day in and day out. Still, took a stand against the predators who robbed them of what they're worth. Why should a pack of bu bougie, cahooting rat efforts scare us off now? I'll keep that in mind, Mr. President. Revolutions rarely happen overnight, kid. I'd rather ten comrades who do... Keep that in mind, then 10,000 who don't. And give me the telephone, we're going to have a chat with our friend, Meanie. Cool, so, I'll see you just in a little bit. Alright everyone, how does the White House celebrate? Conversations lulled as the Chief of Staff Tyner, a folder cradled in his arms, and the President Hall entered the conference room. All eyes snapped towards the two, awaiting their pronouncement. Hall returned their stares lovely before he spoke. Alright folks, it's almost showtime, and you bozos aren't sitting it out if I can help it. That goes double for Martin. Laughter sur serrated, uh, susurrated as the Secretary of Defense nodded at the GS. Pull up your chest and act like you won, because we did win something, and it's right here. Hall swiped Tyner's phone and waved it around. Back strained up at the gesture. Today we proved to America that real change began in the streets and ghettos smeared with our comrades' blood, and today we'll show that change is all America will see from here on out. Take pride, each of you, in having done your part to make this happen. Now, let's head upstairs. They're waiting for us. The walk to the balcony was silent, full of nerves. Hall slept into his thoughts. These days, he spent more time thinking than doing, thinking the next four years, securing Congress, the riots down south. Redneck reactionaries, a lot of them, crawling out of the woodworks from Richmond to Phoenix, but he'll deal with them in time. The door swung open. The morning draft brushed past callous skin, and all thought was washed away by the sea of mankind that greeted them below. Red and white and black swept from the south lawn to the Washington Monument and the horizon beyond. An unseen weight was lifted from his shoulders. The old man felt his pace lighten for the first time in decades. Hall ascended the podium, and the sea let out an ear-splitting roar. The Unionists could only raise the act high enough above his head before the people claimed his sent his whole. With a rally that never ends, but lies and wait for the good news. Increase the status of civil rights. Yaki's popularity grows a bit as the, de the Democrats win a huge coup. Wow. Wrangle the NPP? Why not? The forces of reaction take poorly to threats against the system they had built, and from which they alone have profited. Their foresight portended one such threat from the unprecedented victories we had earned in 48. Like dragons fearful for their hoarded gold, Capitol Hill's elites lashed out. Sheer desperation compelled the party of Lincoln into forming ranks with slavers and secessionist sons, and from their union was born a Frankenstein as colossal and as abominable as it was laden with historical irony. Not to be outdone, the few who remained opposed to the Republican Democrat chimers answered with a corrupt bargain of their own. Party figures both past and present justified the subsequent slaver secessionists united front by parodying Benjamin Franklin that we must hang together or hang separately. Hence, America's proletariat compromised their principles to prevent their loved country, their beloved country, from declining into a one-party state as two intervening decades show their sacrifices were repaid with lip service, inaction, and in many cases, betrayal. 
The Hall administration enters 1973 with a mandate from the scorn and forgotten. They recall keenly what their solidarity was worth through their allies in Congress. We recall broken promises, empty platitudes, assurances capriciously forgotten when put to task. A reckoning long overdue shall visit the likes of Thurman and Jackson, Chase Smith and Kirkpatrick until their party, our party, is recast into a front united, not just in name, but in will and as want as well. Of course, further divided, some center senators will be persuaded to join their cause. Interesting. Now, civil rights. Now, we got a lo higher level of it, right? So, union. Wait. White list, okay? What else we got around here? Engines of war. Black market. Trading is light. Ooh. Titan union requirements. Oil crisis. Imposed rationing. American free of fascism. Killing the tariffs. Conservative finance under Barry Goldwater. High, high unity lessons from Africa. More men, more munitions. Military Kenyanism. Reforming the banks. Crusade against, I think it was corruption. Yeah. What else we got here? Mm, we also have, a we weaken the AFL-CIO, American Malays, Re we have revolutionary civil rights legislation. There we go. Cool. Sins of the Father, though. In 25, Calvin Coolidge asked heaven for a watchdog to protect the corporate profits from workers demanding their labor's worth. Providence answered with the man who would later found America's unique spin on the fascist secret police. With a drive matched only by hunger for power, J. Edgar Hoover and the Federal Bureau of Investigation waged war on the American working class where justice feigns at blindness most. He wiretapped activists and traded their families' well-beings for silence, infiltrated unions and forced disappearances, all while shipping himself into an indispensable tool for American political industrial apparatus. Now even the director's masters tread carefully around him in his office vault. After all, he might just have kept a bone or two from each of their shoddy closets. Yet service, as long as Coovers begets enemies and rumors alike combined, they have events, opportunities, hidden from eyes too friend to pry, but Gus Hall is not so easily cowed. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. The sins of the father. Get the Supreme Court justice, so be it. And what's that one? We shall raise the sickle. Hoover does not act alone in suppressing the American proletariat struggle. He has been aided since the prohibition by a league of agents, informants, and associates both within the police and without. Abetted by officials themselves, dancing to his true master's tune, they are his wolves and wolves' coats. Leading ship away from green pastures and sunlight, through them his wills made known, and by them does his influence reverberate to all four of the country's corners. Like toxic fumes, these servants pervade American politics every so often, ossifying until the director's ominous presence is felt by those who dare defy prophet's will. At the day's end, though, however, there are men and women no more exempt from human feelings than Joe Public. A good and good masters know when to pick servants which resemble the most. We know Hoover is a cross-dressing homophile. What sorts of prolificacy do his underlings indulge in? Our men can't wait to find out. The day of reckoning approaches. Breakfast talk. How's the day, Mr. Secretary? Said President Gus Hall between slurping a plate full of eggs. It took some trial and error, but William Martin was no longer feared, or no longer feared his daily walk to the President's dining room. Observe and act on the right habits, and getting along with a man was almost trivial. First, Mr. Hall had little patience for weather talk. We've underestimated the amount of profiling needed, Martin replied, but work continues my, apace. My our agents should be done compiling records by fall, after which prosecutions will similarly follow. Ah, so we'll twiddle our thumbs for six months then, Hall wiped yoke, and coffee off his chin with a paper towel and tossed it aside. The crumpled ball rolled to a stop near a thick folder, while the bougies get their balls back and laugh at us from on top of the Empire State. The Secretary of Defense winced. As soon as he learned, Hall took failure from his underlings as slice to himself. Habit number two. President Hall looked stood up and paced around the room, hands behind his back, as if considering how to best dispose of a meddlesome pest. We're facing cowards in high towers, Martin. They can wait things out. A storm like ours has weeks before it dies. He gestures towards the folder, motioning the Secretary to open it, which is why I'm sending your boys some help. A change of plans. What met Secretary Martin in the cover page were blood red letters printed bold. Hoover material they spelled out. A little birdie told me Hoover has a lot of fish. I want you to catch as much as you can. Everything else will follow once we air out the stench. Martin witnessed Hall's third habit before he left, getting his way by hook or crook. Oh boy. Trying to modernize as well. Good for them. Advanced jet interceptors. Well, that's cool and all. Let's go for something in 1980. Multi row combat stuff, huh? And invest in the GDP because we can. Raise the sickle. Uncover our crimes. Marx and Lenin both caution that classes uphold their own interests before all else. Thus, it is natural for workers, irrespective of race and creed, to organize when organizing improves their workplace and wages. Likewise, it's natural for capitalists to lie and swindle when lying and swindling improves their bottom line. Granted, decades of reprisal has suppressed a former nature among America's workforce, but the latter dominates the news where there is news to report, though as an American virtue rather than as an abhorrent vice. No greater or example of a capitalist inherent duplicity exists within the South African war. Covetous of the continent-sized riches held sway by German fascism. German America's 
Wealthy grifters bankrolled from beginning to end. A conquest war marked his liberation. The republics and Congress painted a free nation under attack, willfully ignoring those it had kept unfree since its founding. Their mouths in the media depicted a crusade akin to 1863. Never mind the African villages slaughtered wholesale by machine guns and napalm, and they themselves presented grandiose plans for Nazi Africa's reconstruction, all in but name, a looted continent trading the fascist slave masters for United Brands and Standard Oil. By its conclusion, America was only convinced that the men had fought the good fight in the Dark Continent to uphold the narrative injustices planned and perpetrated by these good fighters were left to gather dust in the Pentagon's archives. In the spirit of honest Abe, and for his legacy's sake, we shall bring the truth to light. Uh, OFN grows a little divided, and army professionalism gets worse. Last minute briefing. Turn to page 24, said Secretary of Defense William Martin. Shuffled papers join the Situation Room's air conditioning as a bureaucrat cleared his throat. Clean sweep is divided into two phases, he continued. Phase one consists of leaks distributed by our agents and major TV and newspaper agencies. Over the course of several weeks, they will clandestinely receive sensitive material implicating the U.S.'s intelligence and military service in criminal activities deliberately kept hidden from the public. We expect anti-government sentiment to manifest once such material is disseminated, provided the administration cause to enact phase two. We'll sweep the beltway clean of its rod it's got. President Gus Hall stood up, then paced to and fro the room's front end. No one gets a pass, not even the highest general or the lowliest clerk. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, doesn't matter how many will lose their jobs by the end of it. Doesn't matter if they got kids to feed or alimonies to pay. Their hands are stained with their comrades' blood, and it's up to us to put them to task. The unionists glance towards the seated men. One cigar chewing man in particular, there's that gleam on your eyes again. Larry, excited? Secretary of Treasury, Larry Itliong, grinned as he waved his favorite pass over the air. Putan Gina, boss, he said. I've been waiting this for this for a while now. Of course I'm excited. The veteran striker pointed two fingers. The three other ended right at their knuckles. At, at the man seated behind him. Hiss, too, I think. Secretary of State Alger Hiss nodded in assent. And as usual, Vice President Robert pa Paul Robeson said nothing besides occasional yawn. Not that the others expected him to say so much uh, as to open his copy of Martin's report. Old men need their beauty sleep, so the jape went. Morning nears for the Titans of American Labor. Oh, boy. And the infiltration. The FBI has meddled in the affairs of labor unions long enough. It's time to put them in their place. We will permanently end the infiltration carried out by the Bureau and all its agents in the labor unions of our America. Such an event will draw support from our comrades among the old left and the socialist elements of the NPP. Through a combination of budget cuts, reassignments, and internal affairs investigations, we will hamstring the FBI's ability to monitor union activity. Once they realize we're not worth the trouble, real work can begin. Goes a bit more unified, goes with more popularity. Oh, we got two things here, nice. Our hands are pl is placed to power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies multiplied a thousand fold. We can bring to birth the new world from the ashes of the old, for the Union makes us strong. Except from the House Committee of Truth and Reconciliation hearing, Congresswoman Esma Harper, uh, LP. LNPP, Illinois 15. I will not repeat myself, Mr. Hughes. Where was Bravo Company on the night on December 15th? He was Hughes. He, Captain, serial number something. Harper, so you maintain that Bravo Company was nowhere near Pot Fontaine when Colonel Hawkins issued the order to, and I quote, pacify guerrilla activities within the town premises? Yes, ma'am. Don't lie to us, Hughes. The records clearly state the 2nd Battalion was sent headfirst to Pot Fontaine in the Christmas Blitz. Or did you pack, or did your pack of baby killers just off into the nowhere right before their friends pulled the trigger? Just to clarify, Captain, what did you mean by nowhere near Pot Fontaine? We, that we weren't in Pot Fontaine. Pot Fontaine. Fontaine. When it happened, Battalion HQ had its re reese several miles inland after we took that to town. My boys heard about the massacre only after Hawkins requested our bureau detail. We didn't, didn't. Uh, cool. We've heard enough, Mr. Hughes. Bravo Company's willful inaction is damning in and of itself. Far from being absolved of guilt, you and your men have made yourselves complicit in the deaths of 85 innocent men, women, and children by failing to prevent their murders, misdeeds, let alone bring them to life. And nothing's going to change that, sir. Not even fancy sounding words of, to some piece of paper. Dismissed. Oh boy. The scoop. The crash happened so fast that Secretary Martin almost believed it would never happen. As it were, rivulets of brown and black join a thousand ceramic shards and marring the linoleum great seal of the Oval Office floor. Since the short seconds when gravity took hold on what was once President Gus's Hall's coffee mug, he and all his interns could do was gawk at Ground Zero. Deep breaths left President Hall in a steady rhythm. No one said a squeak. Some inhales and exhales later, he muttered, So he's not just a fascist lap dog, eh? Chuckles. Martin felt his neck hairs jolt ramrod straight, not just, but a uh, cross dressing homophile, too, all this time. Uh, all under our effing, he spat, noses. Martin knew better than to disrupt the gear cycling behind the president's enigmatic head, so he cleared his throat. Better signal intent to parlay rather than speak out of turn. When, said the president, the Secretary of Defense checked his watch whenever. I want this hall held up Martin's dossier, plastered on every tabloid in America by tomorrow morning, or by tomorrow sundown. 
Starting with a secret friend, he tossed the folder away, landing atop coffee and ceramic with a loud squelch. Amber fluids had drenched its underside when Martin picked it up. His gaze lingered at the compromat, the culmination of his team's hasty work, further reaching than, it ever he, than even he anticipated. The sly old dudes will wish his heart had failed him last. May once this leaks. Last? May once. Casting aside his doubts, Secretary Martin nodded silently. The president offered his first grin since the meeting began. Smart man, now get out of my sight. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. I love GDP. The scandal. Seize Washington. Today followed the revelation of the so-called Beltway Expose, which disclosed the illicit affairs of several dozen F federal officers or officials, most notably FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Enforcement were deployed on Mr. Hoover's 30th place northwest residence where riding was the most intense according to eyewitnesses. Similar confrontations occurred at Adams Morgan, Glover, Glover Park, and National Mall. Emergency services reported 12 dead and 37 wounded since the demonstrations began. Demanding the resignation of subsequent 12, J. Edgar Hoover and his associates for obscenity charges, thus no far statement... Thus far, no statement has been forthcoming from the director's office or from the White House. Agencies announced that 127 employees have been discharged for undisclosed or confidential reasons. The wave of resignations came at an unfortunate time for the federal government, whose approval ratings have reached a 20-year low, according to a Gallup poll released last Tuesday. Found dead after fire broke out in their van, Ness apartment, this morning at 3.35 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Chief of Police Jerry Wilson issued a statement suspecting arson, the latest in a series of ideologically motivated attacks within the D.C. metro area. The suspect's whereabouts are unknown at this time. More news? After the, after the break. And the final focus, a new Red Dawn. It is 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The marble banks of Washington, D.C. glow a faint orange against this afternoon sunset while feather-like clouds mottle the wide blue sky. Men in suits amble the National Mall on their way home, satisfied after a 9-to-5 drawing spreadsheets in four-foot cubicles. CEOs converge in the city's finest clubs and restaurants and loose themselves to our orgiastic debauchery and the legal made legal by the almighty dollar's vote. A mother of three trades her cashier attire for two hours of sleep in an apron smeared with a clown's grin. Black siblings too young to count huddle together for warmth, heedless of the landowner prowling for rent. SP, the capital sights and re rebel in a day peaceful day drawing to its end, when there should begin their eight hours of rest and when the poor begin another eight hours of work. Come the next morning, an anonymous source will release their own hundred days' work to everyone with an iron ear. No mind will remain docile against a deluge of sin to come. And when dawn rises over the Potomac, its angry glare exposing a myriad of truths from just as many hypocrites, the nation will strike as a hammer on hot iron. The FBI, CIA, NSA, those within which re Wall Street's pilfering monopolists had for so long bent the workers' back shall break before our people rouse into action. Rebel today's peace for tomorrow, and in the coming decade, peace will be distant memory. After the partial pacification of the reactionary fifth column within the F and within the federal government, we can begin to at long last travel down the long, rocky road to American socialism. Cool. I guess there's no event for the other ones too. Revolutionary civil rights le legislation. One group has certainly benefited from this act of the Yaquis. Oh, that's kind of cool. Well, they have a slightly more influence. Not that much, though. And the center has just been decimated to death. Holy cow. Love it. Break time, pastime. It was noon in the steel mill, and the four men had gathered around the bre break rooms only rated for a special occasion. Call a new ritual among the union men of Philadelphia, built upon the logic that every expose of the Fed's misdeeds strengthens the proletariat's class consciousness at their oppressor's expense. Rosie said as much when she badgered James to join the crowd right with the stench of half a day shift. He thought the boys were running low on excuses to relive at Election Day 72. Either way, the man's participation was decided by a standoff between his logic and his friend's emotions, her large, glimmering, dog-eyed emotions. Naturally, emotion won over logic, and so James realized his voice had joined several other dozens and howling like baboons when CBS reported a day's leak. A tally su suspected FBI infiltrators and strike breakers in the Mid-Atlantic area. Sony carried with him a handheld blackboard and some chalk, anticipating like everyone else the other half of every noon time drop for the last two weeks. That's one, three, nine, right? Shouted James' fellow blonde over the break room's cacophonous din. There was laden, or laden with crisp dollar bills and elbow grease. You better... Get better ears, Dumbo. You're off by 12, shouted Rosie back. That was all James could do to not buckle under the woman who claimed his shoulders for the time being. Was she this heavy before? <laughs> Both of you idiots got it wrong, boomed another voice. Corwin's, he figured. If Cronkite said 164, it's 164, and that's final. As ad hoc conversation devolved into a shouting match, James let out a quiet sigh. Only a madman could have predicted that betting on fire deploys would become a pastime. Speckles of levity amidst a national tragedy. Cool. But... If that's it, that's probably it for uh, the contents for this guy. Not yet. Oh, we got one more. I'm glad I let time go on. 
William Martin's first and only impression of Langley was built by his car park. Vehicles of every size and shape, every brand and every color packed end to end the wide asphalt plain nestled with the forests of Northern Virginia. He expected nothing less from the intelligence services that Orpos HQ rumors said quadrupled even Langley's ginormous size. Evergreen zoomed by until the limousine slowed to a stop, nodding at his driver. The Secretary of Defense stepped off and beheld Langley for the second time in his life. He caught his breath, though. No Red Fords, no black Mercedes Benz, no yellow Chryslers, no GMs. The plains were devoid of the colorful beasts of preserve with nothing to preserve. Further afield, the gray, the drab gray compound stood as a lonesome giant in the man-made clearing. This was a CIA's glass and concrete heart. Every beat relayed orders to 10,000 agents across America and beyond. But its pulse faded as staff left or were made to leave in droves and now laid empty and still. In a way, the heart's dormancy struck Martin with awe and dread alike. Such a titan. Silence by his hand. And for as long as its heart remains silent, the CIA is impotent against its foes. When shall its slumber end? Must it end at all? So many questions and so few answers. Done sad scene yet? Called a voice from the limousine. We've got work to do, Martin. Save the naval gazing for that ugly dude's turn to rubble. Secretary Martin gave one last glimpse at the sleeping giant before he heeded the president's orders. For better or worse, its fate, like his, is Gus Hall's to call. Slivers of doubt gnaw the headman's conscience. Lose 50 expertise. Oh, that's true. We are using CIA. We'll get more political power and lose... 12% stability, wow. Now it'd be kind of cool if Martin could eventually like overthrow Hall, because I don't know, you never know. But regardless, oh, we're not done yet, and the story's untold. A briefcase slammed against a linoleum, followed by a suit of 64 kilos of scarred in turn, or scared in turn. Another man, of an old loomed over, both like a conqueror astride his horse. In a fit of desperation, the intern aimed his pleading gaze upwards. Seventy-one years' experience had bestowed upon Judge Crowley the countenance of mountain peaks, cold and muting every distance. Try as he might, the intern found no purchase on the cracks and creases of his aged visage. Words echoed from the judge's depths, whispered like winter winds which froze the intern in place. My hands are tied, Fowler rumbled the mountain. They set their sights on the Justice Department. Your kind can't hide from them here. You've... You've the day to clear your cubicle. An imperceptible nod before the mountain returned to his office. But for his, well, former co-workers, the intern would have thought himself alone. And he convinced himself that he was alone, that he was free from the cuts left by their, atones, their stony leaders. Fowler's lonely mind wandered to happier times past, leaving Harvard Law with head and H PhD held high, exploring the Appalachians with his mom and sis, being met with the hug hugs and happy tears after confiding a secret. The night later, when he had laid bare his heart and more to Oscar, they shared so much in the warm afterglow his smile ached from the memory alone, a small bungalow overlooking the Hudson, their own Monticello, with tidy white fences and a clean-cut lawn, kisses and chicken casserole, greeting him after a long day in court, a future that had plenty in store for a man and the love of his life had warmth welled in Fowler's eyes. Shivers ran up and down his back. He choked back a ragged breath, while walls and eyes pressed against him. Men don't cry, he thought men shouldn't cry. Then again, they said Jake Fowler never was much of a man either. Okay, so is that it? Maybe the final one? What happens to, uh... Huh. Cool. So if that is finally it, that might be finally it, maybe? Maybe not? And I guess it's 73, and the Divine Mandate is looking pretty thick. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed this little video regarding Gus Hall's first couple months, weeks, into what his presidency will potentially look like, eventually. Seems very fun, very interesting to, to destroy the CIA and the FBI and the NSA. It sounds like a lot of fun to me, but I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you all tomorrow in a different video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.